We're on page 90. Uh, Jesus has uh, told his disciples on the previous passages, uh, a couple pages, let's go through Galilee one more time. You remember at the beginning, he went through every town, village in Galilee. Then he sends out his 12, and they go through every village and town in Galilee. And he's saying, let's do it one more time. And he sends them out. And then we'll find in this passage, he goes to every village and town himself. He had been in every village and town at least two or three times. Uh, that's why I can say, if the works done in you would have been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented long ago. There's not a province in the history of mankind that got more concentrated effort than the province of Galilee. And we'll come to the end of that uh, ministry. On the top, page 90, after Jesus telling his disciples what would happen as they go out, that they would accuse them of doing it by Beelzebub, just like they did uh, the master of the house, Jesus. He will say that's the way it's going to be. Don't worry about it. Verse nine, uh, Page 90, top of the page. A very important concept. I love these verses. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's will. Even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. And that, in this crazy day, when we're upset over the little minnows and not upset over embryo within the womb of uh, expectant mothers, we have to realize what Jesus says. Human beings are more important than animals. Animals are not made in the image and likeness of God. Human beings are. It's the only thing, Dr. Smith says this a lot, the only thing God saves out of his creation, his first creation, is human beings. Everything else gets burned up. That should show us something about priorities. And that should be our priority as well. People are more important than their possessions, more important than, than our hobbies, more important than any animal we could imagine. Human beings are forever. And that makes them very, very valuable. So valuable, Jesus dies for us. He didn't die for a fish. Okay. And then Jesus goes on to say, you know, there's going to be struggle from without, to be sure. Uh... But there's going to be struggle right within families. Do not think, verse 34, that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes will be those of his own household. And look what Jesus says. Next section. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his cross and follow is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. If you live it for yourself, you lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. And that, that is really strong talk. Jesus is saying to the disciples, you're doing the right thing following me. You've put me above mom and dad and, and everything else. And that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's supposed to be for all of us. When you prioritize your order of importance of things in life, it goes like this, really. I live for God. And if I live for God, I function the way he wants me to in the church. That's number two priority. Number three is the family. If I'm not functioning the way I should in the church, I can't be functioning the way I should in my family. It's that simple. You're not giving the right illustration to your children. Most people say, oh, no, it's not like that. Yes, it is. We are responsible to live according to the oversight of the church. They are responsible for our souls. They, they have the authority over us. We are to obey those that rule over us. Now, that's not popular teaching. It's not even thought of. But that's the structure we have in the Bible. God, his church, the important family, the more important than natural family. Better have that right. If I'm functioning right with God, I'll function right in the church. If I'm functioning right in the church, I'll function right in my family. And then the responsibility of the world, and if I have those in order, I'm going to be living the way I should in the world. Do you struggle with that order? 
Most of us will put family first. That's not our ultimate authority on earth. The ultimate authority on earth is Christ is the head of the church and there are people who he has appointed as overseers to whom we are responsible in the conducting of our life. Now, that doesn't show in a democratic world. And it's hard to make it show in the church. But we'd be saved a lot of grief if that order were in place. All of us would be. What you can do is say, in my family, God first. As for me and my house, what's the rest of that? We will serve the Lord. That's right. You make that decision up front. How many of you folks have that hanging in your house someplace? That's a great thing. I love that. You know, if that's there, you know their heart's right. That's what they're after. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's putting God first, church, family, world. The job that we get, the career, is just to pay what we need to do to get all that done. That's what it's about. And he says, you find your life then. Famous statement from Jim Elliot. Do you know it? He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. One of the martyrs. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And that's what this is all about. He who loses his life for my sake. You live for God. You preserve yourself. That's the saving of the soul, making your life count for God. And he's saying to his disciples, that's your job, guys. Yeah, it's going to be hard. Your own family may not think you have your head screwed on. They said that about me. They tried to, Jesus said that. Uh, I'm not me, me. Uh, Jesus said, uh, they said that about me. My, my mother and, and brothers and sisters came and said, come on, we agree with your friend. You're beside yourself. Take a break. Relatives interfered, his friends interfered. And he says, and who are my relatives? Who is my mother? Who are my brothers and sisters? The mass students, that's who. Not the people who put material things above all. It's people who put Jesus above all. They're my family. And he's telling them it's going to be hard. Because people won't like that. The close folk won't like that. But you do the right thing before God. Save your life. Mm. So they went out and preached. Boy, they were fired up. Let's do it. They went out and preached that men should repent and cast out many demons and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. And they went out for this one last blitz through Galilee. Why didn't Galilee believe? We'll find out. Jesus will tell us. When, it, when Jesus had finished his pep talk for the twelve, he went out from there to teach and preach in their cities. He sends them out two by two. That's his pattern. Here's your message. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Don't talk to the Gentiles yet. I'll tell you about that at the Great Commission when I tell you to go into all the world. But not yet. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Tell them the kingdom's ready to come. I'm offering it. Repent, the kingdom is at hand. And don't make any provision for yourself because a, a messenger of the king should live off the king's people. He'll change that advice later. And boy, they're fired up. And they go out and then he goes out and Galilee gets one last opportunity to respond to the great message. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. While this is going on, Word comes back about John the Baptist on page 91, paragraph 85. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. And he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. Wait a minute. Raised from the dead? We hadn't heard that. And about this time, it gets to, the, to Jesus and the disciples. John the Baptist had been read from the other side of the and that sort of thing. And then verse 3 in Matthew's column, For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison. You remember uh, Jesus fled from uh, Judea when they imprisoned John. He went through Samaria, the woman of Samaria thing. John was in prison. He had been in prison. You remember John sent messengers and said, Are you the Messiah or do we look for another? Remember that? He hasn't been in prison all this time. And now word comes, 
that he had died. He'd been killed. How'd that work out? Herod had seized John, bound him, put him in prison. For the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because you remember John the Baptist saying, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't marry your brother's wife. <laughs> that makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> you shouldn't marry your brother's wife. And John had said to her, it's not fault lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias, his wife, had a grudge against him, wanted to kill him, but she couldn't. Because her husband Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and kept him safe in prison from his wife. Whoa. When he heard him, he was much perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. There's this debate kind of thing going on. He listens to what John has to say, and he likes to listen to him, but he gets all worked up, so he throws him back in his cell. And he brings him out again, talks to him, you know, and then John says the truth and throws him back in. So it's going on like this. Well, he kept him safe. And now he wanted to put him to death if he the people because they had held him to be a prophet. So there's that antagonism in his brain. But when Herod's birthday came, he had a great big birthday party. And uh, Herodias' daughter, and this is a thing you should not picture. I'm big on picturing things. This is a thing you shouldn't picture. Uh, Herodias' daughter, what's her name? It doesn't show up in Scripture, but there's a wonderful tradition. Salome. Okay. I won't ask you about that. Uh, she came in and danced and pleased Herod and his guests. And you can imagine what kind of dance that was, but you shouldn't. Okay? And the king said to the girl, this drunken, half-crazed, aroused king says to this girl, Ask me for whatever you wish and I will grant it. Is that a stupid thing to say because a girl can dance? Now, we all know what was going on. This, this guy was just uh, foaming at the mouth. He vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what do you think of that, Jezebel? <laughs> what shall I ask, Herodias? She said, the head of John the baptizer. Well, that's a pleasant thought. She came in immediately with haste to the king, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. This is a birthday party. king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, and he didn't want to lose face or break his word to this wicked girl and her wicked her mother, immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard, gave orders to bring his head. He went in, beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. Sweet ladies, aren't they? Ooh. When the disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. And here's the paragraph. On their return, the apostles told him what they had done. Now, most of these disciples were followers of John to start with. And they hear this after the tough Galilean ministry with the growing opposition. Here's what they hear right at the end. John the Baptist has been executed. Now, let's put two and two together. If the forerunner of the king is dead and the Galilean ministry is sort of fizzling out to zero, how's this offer of the kingdom going? Huh? Yeah, not very well. Not very well. But remember, Pontius Pilate and Herod and the nations and the Jews were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your counsel before determined to be done. That scripture might be fulfilled. That scripture might be fulfilled. It's all there. And they're executing precisely what God has in mind. Of their own choice. Intellectual tension there. Jesus says to them, I love this. This is so, so sensitive. Men are not very sensitive generally, and I'm at the top of that list probably. Come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. The bottom of their world sort of had just fallen out. The person by whom they came to faith had just been executed. 
They heard about it now. And Jesus says, uh, this has been pretty heavy. Let's take a break. Come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. They didn't have any leisure. So they get into a boat. And uh, went to a lonely place on the other side of the Sea of Galilee to a city area called Bethsaida. And they had some peace for a while. When the crowds learned where they had gone, they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. You know, they're out there on the lake for a little bit of time. They're going to this other little distant little town. And the word got out, they're going to Bethsaida. And off they go. And when they land on shore, he landed. Uh, there were all sorts of people around. A great throng. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and Luke's column. And when it grew late, his disciples came and said, You're a lonely place. All these people are here. There's no handy 7-Eleven. It's supper time. What are you going to do? Send the crowd away to go to the villages and country around about to lodge and Get provisions for it. We're out here in the boonies. Uh, Jesus says to Philip, How are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? This he said to test him. This is quiz time for Jesus. He himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, You know, if I had about two-thirds of a year's salary, we couldn't feed all these people. A denarius is what a common laborer would get for a day's work. If we had 200 of them, uh, two-thirds of a year's income. We couldn't feed all these people. We couldn't give them enough to eat. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. Jesus said, give them something to eat. This is an impossible commandment. And Philip had already said that. And he said, oh, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. Unless we or to go and buy food for all these people. And then he says, how many people are there? For there were 5,000 men. Look over on the page, verse uh, 21, the first column. 5,000 men beside women and children. How many people do you think there were? Pardon? At least 10,000. It's always been the story of the feeding of the 5,000. It should be called the feeding of the 10 plus thousand, probably. There's a lot of people. Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them and eat? How many loaves have you? Say, well, well, we'll see. And they come back, one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, there's a boy here with his lunch. That's all this is. It's a lad here who has five barley loaves. Now look, you know, when we think of five loaves of bread, you think of some, some Frenchman walking along in France with those long loaves of bread like this. Even that wouldn't be much, but these are like little rolls for sandwiches with a sardine in them. Well, these are just little fish. This is not, you know. It's his kid's lunch. It's in his brown bag his mom had fixed it for. Lad here with five barley loaves, two fish. What's that among 10,000 people? Let's answer that question. Not much. Uh, Jesus says, this is one of the few things in the Gospels that is all, in all four Gospels. Uh, let's make some observations about how they are seated here. He ordered the crowds to sit down. And it was, wasn't just any old way. How, how were they told to sit down? Companies of 50s? Fifty each. Why do you do that? To tell us that a local church should only have fifty people in it, that's why. Or you know, you should never serve more than fifty at once, or why do you have them seat down, sit, seated in groups of fifties, more or less? Come on, some someone of you who have the gift of administration answer that. Pardon? 
Ray, this is not complicated. Suppose they're one clump of people. How do you serve them? So he had to sit down in groups with little aisles in between. So he organized it. Jesus had the gift of administration. You would have expected that since he created the heavens and the earth. Sit down in companies. Uh, what else do you see about how he seated them? You notice down below he in groups by hundreds and fifty, so it wasn't ironclad. But uh, what else can you say about where he seated them? He seated them in groups. What else? On the grass. Why do you see them on the grass? It's comfortable. There's much grass. There's a great place. Spread them out in groups of fifty and a hundred. Over on the grassy hillside there, overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And so they're comfortable. Okay, so they're all seated now. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed it. Jesus gives thanks for the food, blesses it. Very good custom. We all do that, don't we? Should. The food is to be received, Paul will tell us, with thanksgiving. And he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowd. Now, visualize this. Here's this, this little basket of food. And God get, and Jesus gives thanks to his Father in heaven for it and then starts breaking the bread. Do you know how much bread you had to break out of those little loaves to feed 10,000 people? You had to be sitting here saying, what is going on here? How is he doing this? Oh, there, here's one loaf. Peter, give this one to me. He does it again. He gives it to the next guy. Gives it again. Keeps doing this. Keeps doing it. This is a big time miracle. Anybody had half a brain could say, you know, when we came, there were just 12 disciples and Jesus sitting there and there, there was not a big van full of food. There was nothing. And look at us all now. We're having this great meal. That had to be the best fish sandwich you ever had in your life. Made straight from heaven. And I like the columns. They all ate and were satisfied. They all ate and were satisfied. They all ate and were satisfied. And I liked I liked John's column the best. And when they had eaten their fill. Fill is even better than satisfied. And Jesus is uh, he's going to have a Tupperware party after this. Uh, so he collects uh, all these uh, extras. And yes, Jesus has leftovers that nothing may be lost. The girls, put that up in your kitchen, okay? Uh, Jesus originated leftovers. The proper use of leftovers. Twelve basketfuls left over, and everybody makes the application. That's, that's one for each of the apostles. And then the summary statement. And they said, oh, no, the prophets come into the world. He fed us all. That's why Jesus is trying to slow things down when he kept saying, don't, tell, don't go telling everybody, you know, because people are following me for signs, not for the truth. So he says, okay, dismissed. He made the disciples get into the boat. The disciples got into the boat to go before him to the other side. He dismissed the crowds. He goes up on the mountain to pray. Look what uh, we have in John. Perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. If you can feed the people without work, you'll be the king. It's that simple. If you can guarantee a chicken in every pot for the rest of your life, everybody would vote for you. That's just the way it is. And Jesus said, oh man, I fed him. And now they're saying, hey, look, he'd be a good king. He'd be better, better than the one we have. You know, he can make food. So he, withdraw he withdraws. He dismissed the crowds, he went up into the hills to pray by himself. And he sends the disciples in the boats back to home, where they had come from. Okay, now look at the next page. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. They're going back home. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. He's up there praying all night. And he says, I'll go home. 
But the boat by this time was out on the sea, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And uh, he was alone on land. He saw they were distressed and rowing, for the wind was against them. And deep into the night, the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Here comes, do you know the song? Here comes Jesus. Do you know that one? See him walking on the water. You know, it's kind of neat. They saw him walking on the sea. They thought it was a ghost. Cried, whoa, somebody's walking on the water. They all saw him and were terrified. Would that scare you to see somebody walking on a lake? Scare me. Yeah. He immediately spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Have no fear. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come to you on the water. Is this a famous miracle? Everybody knows this one. Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Is that good? Would you do that? And Peter could swim. Well, here comes Jesus. Well, here's the boat. Here's Jesus walking. And Peter gets out of the boat, puts his foot on the water. Hey, this is working. Walks to Jesus. He said, come. Peter got out of the boat. Peter walked on the water. It says that he walked on the water. Do you think Peter walked on the water? We always have a picture of Peter up to about here. No, he walked for a while on the water. And when he saw the wind, and did you ever see the wind? You don't see the wind. What do you see? You see the wind whipping up a, a, a wave that's coming at you. He was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Very short prayer. Uh, when you're going down, they're very short prayers. This is not the time for a long prayer introduction. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him and says, oh man, a little faith, why did you doubt? What's the hardest step to take if you're walking on the water? What's the hardest step? The first step's a hard one. After you've done that, you say, this is a doable thing with faith. Do, do, do. And that's why Jesus rebuked him. When they got into boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you're the Son of God. When they came over to Gennesaret, that is close to Capernaum, uh, they have a little problem. The people come along, down the next, pa the next paragraph, on the next day, the people who remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. They are saying now, this being the next day, with all the boats having departed, they have a question. The question is, Jesus, how did you get here? How would Jesus answer if he would tell them the truth? How did Jesus get there? We know how he's, on, he's up there praying. He comes down by the shore. He sees the guys having trouble. He walks out to them, and immediately they're on land. When they would say to Jesus, how did you get here? All the boats had left. How did you get here? How, how should he have answered them if he was going to tell them the truth? I walked. I walked. The boat was already out there. I saw they had left. I walked on the water, got in the boat, and we came here. How did you get here? I walked. Jesus said, I'm not going to answer that question. And we have the introduction uh, to the Bread of Life Discourse. Truly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. This is even worse than not following for, for the, the miracle. This is just because I got a free meal. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for food which endures to eternal life. Okay, I want to put together three people, uh, three situations, and see if you can see the parallelism. What's the story with Nicodemus? How's Jesus start talking to him? Pardon? In literal terms. You must be born again. And Nicodemus said, Look, can I enter a second time into my mother's womb? That's impossible. What do you mean be born again? And he's thinking about physical birth, and Jesus is talking about spiritual birth. It's the physical to the spiritual transition. Woman at the well, how's that one go? 
I want, give me that water so I don't have to come out here and draw water every day. Boy, I can put a line through one of my jobs for every day. Literal to spiritual. I have a tough time getting there. Jesus does the same thing here. You're out here wanting physical food. This bread that I have provided for you. Be looking for eternal bread. Do not labor for food which perishes, but for food which endures to eternal life. Now what in the wide world is food that endures to eternal life? How is Jesus going to answer that question? This is how he's going to answer it. Eat my flesh, drink my blood, you'll have eternal life. Now he's going to take some steps to get there. And I'll explain what that means. What must we do to be working the work of God? Verse 28. Jesus says, this is the work of God. Look, Jesus is not defining believing as a work here. He says, work, this is the work of God. Not work, believe. And he will say in verse 47 across the page, he who believes has eternal life. This is the evangelistic sermon discourse. The first discourse is one for the disciples, how they are to live while the kingdom is being offered. The Bread of Life discourse, just by its title, you should see this, is a discourse on salvation. He who eats my flesh drinks my blood. By that I mean believes me, takes me into his life, believes me. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And they say to him, they say to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? Does that do anything to the, your stomach to hear that? Every time I come on this, I am, Gah! You just ate the food I made. 10,000 of you out of a kid's lunch. And you want a sign? If I were Jesus at that time, I'd have given them a really good sign. What kind of sign would you give them? I'd say, here's a sign. Watch this. The earth is going to open up and swallow you. Whew. There, that takes care of the 10th. At least they died with a full stomach. You know. Yeah. God. Give us a sign. Boy, the patience of Jesus. Our fathers ain't man in the wilderness. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus could say, what do you think I just gave you? Jesus said, oh, you guys are missing it. Truly, I say to you, it was not your Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven, and that's me. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, oh, Give us this, it's just like the woman of Samaria. We won't have to eat anymore. Give us this bread that we live forever. Jesus said, here it is real clear. I'm the bread of life. You get eternal life by eating me. Now they get all upset over that. They see cannibalism in that. Jesus isn't meaning that. He isn't that saying, here, bite my arm. He's saying, take what I'm saying into your life. Accept me. Assimilate me. Now, verses 36, 37, 38, and across the page, we have some of the hard verses. This is in the hard verses of Scripture. In an evangelistic message where he is inviting them to eat the bread of life, he says, I'm going to tell you something. I've never heard an evangelistic message like this. I can't even approach this subject with Christians without them getting their bowels in an uproar. Listen to what he says. I said to you that you have seen me and you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Look at verse 44 on the next page. They're murmuring among themselves about what he's saying. He says, no one, hear this, realize this is a verse of Scripture spoken in an evangelistic message by Jesus who came to die to save people. This is not some dumb theologian saying this. 
He says, no one can come to the Father, come to me, unless the Father who sent me draws them. Do you hear that? Why aren't you coming to me? Verse 36, all the Father gives me will come to me. And he who comes to me I will not cast out, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And there's that not my will, but his will thing. And that probably creates an intellectual problem to us. I've got to hurry on. This is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last time. I'm the bread of life that came down from heaven. They said, no, you're not. You're Joseph's son. We know who you are. And Jesus said, I know why you're saying that. No one can come to me unless the Father sent him draws. Forty-seven, truly I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I'm the bread of life come down from heaven. I'm the bread of life and I give my life for the world. Believe that. Unless you take me into your life, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in him. Now look, this, this is where the first time this, this is my body given for you, this is my blood shed for you shows up. It's before he ever institutes Lord's Supper. What he's talking about here is personal salvation. Eat my flesh, drink my blood means believe me. One of the things we remember when we take the bread and the cup is there, there was a day when I took Jesus into my life like he told us to. When I celebrate the Lord's Supper, one of the things we are reminded of because of this similarity of wording is, once I was lost, now I'm found. There was a day I couldn't take that bread with the God's people because I hadn't taken him into my life and believed, but now I can You should be reminded of your spiritual birthday every time you take a piece of bread at the Lord's table. It's one of the things you think of. And you should say, you should say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I'm so happy I trusted in you when I was a little kid. Thank you. It's not hard to think about the right things of breaking of bread. Think about the bread of life come down from heaven. Oh. This is the bread which came down from heaven. He who eats my flesh drinks my blood abides in me, I in him. He who believes. And he said this as he taught in the synagogue at Capernaum. And they say, next page, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Jesus says, you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? And he will do that. It is a spirit that gives life. These, there are some of you that do not believe. For Jesus from the first knew who those were who would not believe. And he also knew who it was that was to betray him. From the very beginning, he knew he had chosen his betrayer. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Now, the positive thing is, why did you come to Jesus Christ? Because it was granted to you from the Father to do that. That's why. That's what Jesus says. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. And they don't come to me because it was not granted them from the Father. We have come, consequently, because it was granted to us by the Father. And you should say, thank you, God, for doing that. This is an evangelistic message. (laughs) This is not Romans 9. A theological discourse on the will of God and the human responsibility. This is his evangelistic message. Believe, believe, believe. This is the work. Believe. This is the work. Take the bread of life that's come down from heaven. You know why you're not believing? Because no one comes to me unless you're drawn by the Father. No one can come to me unless it's granted by the Father. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. And you're not coming. That's why. He turns to the twelve. Everybody else is gone. How's this for the end of the Galilean ministry? Everybody else is gone. Just for 10,000 people and they're all gone. 
Been through every town and village three times and they're all gone. He turns to the 12, he says, I wish I had a recording of this. Must have been a plaintive voice. He said, are you guys going to go too? Go ahead. You're going to go too. May as well make it 100%. And Peter hits a grand slam home run. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. But didn't I choose you 12 and one of you is a devil? This is spoke about Judas Iscariot. Galilee ministry ends. Success? Pontius Pilate inherited and the nations of the Jews were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your counsel before determined to be gone. The next section, hear this, in the last minute, it'll be a good answer for what about the specialized ministry. He says to the twelve, let's get out of town. Let's get out of Palestine all together. And he goes on into the specialized ministry. And he says, you know, things aren't going well. Uh, who do you say I, the Son of Man, am? And Peter says to him, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, just like he says here. And he says, good for you, Peter. This is in the specialized ministry, he'll say this. You're, do you know the rest of this verse? You're Peter. And on this, what? Rock, what? I will build my church. And they say, they, they don't say this, but they should. You're what? We've been saying kingdom, 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 and you're saying church? First time church is used in the, in the New Testament. I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When's the church begin? Day of Pentecost. What's that do with this kingdom offer? It's going to be withdrawn. Well, we've got two provinces to go to yet. Judea and Perea. We've only done Galilee. And he tells them about the New Deal, the church. And then there's a verse that I'll show you a couple times. This was hidden from them, lest they should understand. Very important concept. In the specialized ministry, the next phase of God's plan for the ages is revealed to us, which is the church. And then he draws a veil over it after that and says, okay, we've got to go to Judea now. Let's go. And in Judea, they preach, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's a good thing they had the veil, where it would be, repent, the king of God's hand is not going to come because the church is coming. We already heard that. But it was hidden from them that they should not understand until it happened. They had a hard time understanding it then. That's what happens in a short sentence in the specialized ministry.